We're here talking about the law of the land, and we should be careful about what we put into the law of our land here. I was wondering if Senator Chapman would yield. Senator Chapman yield. Absolutely. Here in order, Senator Bolton. Thank you, Senator Chapman. I want to take a look at a couple of provisions here in this uh, amendment. Uh, starting at page 2, we look at line 23 uh, and get into the medical emergency standards. It seems pretty confusing what is in and out as exceptions here. Uh, it says here, medical emergency means a situation in which an abortion is performed to preserve the life of the pregnant woman whose life is endangered by a physical disorder, physical illness, or physical injury, including a life-endangering physical condition caused by or arising from the pregnancy, comma, but not including psychological conditions, emotional conditions, familial conditions, or the woman's age, semicolon, or when the continuation of the pregnancy will create a serious risk of substantial and irreversible impairment to a major bodily function of the pregnant woman. So my question to you, Senator Chapman, is after that semicolon, is that included or excluded as a, a factor that would limit or not limit the ability for a woman to, to have an abortion? Senator, I believe it would be included. It's in the, it's in the language. So if it creates a s serious risk of substantial and irreversible impairment, it is included in the list of exceptions? That is correct. It's there. So why, why is it tacked on after the but not including provision? Well, Senator, you do know this is a House amendment. I don't know why they did that. Um, and, and I guess I don't know what, why the confusion's there. I read the same language you do, and I don't appear to be confused about this. The language there is there. It's included as uh, one of the, the purposes of being able to have an exemption. Let me ask you this. Would it have been cleaner to have that, that part after the semicolon ahead of, but not including, just to continue the list? I don't know if it would be clear for, no, I, I guess it's, to me it's fine, it, I read it as it's included. Um, you know, I, I, if you want to get into the semantics of where a semicolon is, uh, I would suggest we debate the merits of the bill. I think we are. <laughs> this is the merits of the bill. We're going to have courts interpreting this language based on where this part of the, 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 the sentence begins and ends. You have, in this amendment, you're including language at the end that I, I agree with you probably is intended to be one of the exceptions to this bill, but it's placed in a, in a way that it is not clear whether it's meant to be an exception or an inclusion. And I'm, sorry there's a, I'm, I'm sorry there's confusion for you, Senator. I think a lot of people are going to be sorry when the courts are interpreting this, and they're going to give us an answer that should have been clarified from the legislative process as opposed to waiting until it's sorted out uh, after this process is done. We could amend this and fix this, could we not? I don't think it needs to be fixed, Senator. Okay. Well, let me take a look at another part of this. Looking at page 5, starting at line 10, this section shall not be construed to impose civil or criminal liability on a woman upon whom an abortion is performed in violation of this section. What kind of civil or criminal liability are we talking about there? Well, I think it's pretty clear that it, it gives total immunity from them, for them. Immunity from what, though? What's the crime? Any criminal or civil liability. Okay, I, we have an entire criminal code, and Again, what this says is that if they are in violation of any section of this code, there will be no criminal or civil proceedings for that woman. Can you, can you envision a crime that, that would be included in that? Just anything that you would think we're worried about someone being charged with? Anytime you violate a statute, there would be a, a, a crime. So I'm not going to speculate what a, a county prosecutor or anyone else would come up with as a criminal 
uh, charge. I'm not going to speculate. Okay. Uh, is there a reason why we haven't included medical care providers in, in this along with the woman? I'm not, I'm not aware of why that would be included or not included, uh, but clearly we include it for the woman. Yeah, we do, uh, which is curious that, that we only include it for, for one party um, in this situation. So I, I think it is concerning that there's a, at least an expectation that crime prosecution would happen, that we would have to go to the extent to prevent that prosecution from happening here, but we're not going to extend that protection to a doctor, to a nurse, to anyone who is part of uh, the medical procedure. A and you don't see that concerning either? That is not a concern for me, Senator. Should it be a concern for a doctor? Doctors are held to a very high standard, as you know. They take, take a Hippocratic Oath, for example. They um, have a uh, medical board that reviews them. Mm -hmm. There's a series of uh, penalties that could come on a, a physician. Uh, and so, yes, they're held to a, a higher standard than a patient. I'd give you that, yes. A higher standard civilly, certainly, but in terms of crime, they wouldn't have any special uh, protection or exclusion from criminal prosecution, right? I don't know, Senator. We haven't done anything in the legislative process to make some kind of magical exclusion from criminal prosecution for, for doctors, right? No. Of course not. But yet here in this bill, we find it necessary to make an exclusion specific to a woman who, who, upon whom an abortion is performed, but do nothing to offer that same protection to the provider. Is it reasonable to say that a provider would believe that he or she could be criminally or civilly prosecuted I'm not going to suggest whether or not a county attorney, each, each situation, as you know, being an attorney, uh, each situation is unique. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell a county prosecutor or any other prosecutor uh, certain circumstances as, as to when and what charges would be filed. I'm not going to, uh, that's not for me to speculate. It's not for you to speculate. You're drafting legislation here. You're creating potentially a crime for a doctor. It's got to be pretty concerning. Okay. Have we thought through this? Is that a question? It if is I a question. Have bill? you thought through the I, consequence of creating an immunity for one party and not for the other, where we would have for the same incident, the same, the same act, one person criminally liable and the other not? S Senator, I can tell you that uh, first and foremost, this is a House amendment. Uh, secondly, yes, we have absolutely vetted this. In fact, we voted on a bill similar to this not that long ago. Uh, as to whether or not why we should have immunity for a doctor or not a doctor, I believe doctors are held to a higher standard. Doctors should be aware of the provisions of this bill, that they are to do a fetal uh, heartbeat ultrasound, if an ultrasound is, uh, you know, a heartbeat is detected, then they have certain obligations and responsibilities under this, this, uh, this bill. If they choose to violate that, then I don't know the proceedings of what a county prosecutor or any other prosecutor would do, but I would recommend that they follow the law that we're passing here today. Senator, do you remember it, when we discussed uh, caps on medical malpractice damages? Do you, do you remember that discussion? This has nothing to do with medical malpractice. Oh, I think it very much does. We're talking about civil and criminal immunities that are not being extended to doctors. So I want to ask you, how does this affect your, your approach to uh, a potential malpractice claim? If it's a potential statutory violation here within your new, new section of the Iowa Code. I don't Is know it, how, it, how it would impact medical malpractice. Obviously, physicians carry medical malpractice for a number of reasons. Uh, and, you know, I, again, physicians should carry medical malpractice. All right. Thank you, Senator. You're welcome. I think I don't know is the, the most important answer that we've received here tonight. Because right now we are walking into a very unclear world 
where this legislation very much attaches criminal liability to doctors, to nurses, and it takes a specific exception for the woman, but doesn't extend it to the practitioner. In effect, failing to do that is going to completely and totally ban abortion procedures in this state because you are creating criminal prosecution with this amendment. We have to take this process extremely seriously. This isn't just dotting I's and crossing T's. This is creating legal obligation and responsibility and yes, criminal liability in our medical system. And shrugging and saying, I don't know, isn't good enough. This bill is one of the worst things about our political system because it achieves a political objective for political reasons while blatantly ignoring very serious consequences it will have on people's lives. Sadly, these are not unintended consequences. These are negative consequences by design. These are not harms of the unknown. These are objectively known harms. It's playing political brinksmanship with reproductive health care in the balance. This body is debating a bill that will be immediately challenged in court. And if it does get enacted, it will be overturned, costing our state's taxpayers more money and inserting new litigation in a judicial system that as of tonight will be once again underfunded. Not only should we not be involved in this endless session, wasting taxpayers' time and money, but we shouldn't be here because this bill is wrong tonight. You threaten access to quality reproductive health care in Iowa by doing this. You push away, as Senator Bolcom pointed out, the OBGYNs we need more of in our state. You make it harder for the University of Iowa to prepare practitioners that we have a shortage of. This is legislating an automatic mandate on Iowans who are facing a very difficult, heart-wrenching decision. A decision that should be made individually and confidentially between a woman and her doctor. The truth is, abortions are safe procedures. And this is an effort that, make no mistake, does seek to ban them altogether. This will lead to more illegal abortions, dangerous and deadly as they will be. Why are we not looking to our common ground here? Why are we not finding ways to restore access to reproductive health care clinics for Iowa women? Why are we not supporting comprehensive sex education and making contraceptives more accessible? Banning abortions doesn't ever decrease abortions. What it does is it decreases safe abortions. If the goal is truly to reduce abortion, we all know the real answer is education and access to contraception. That's your solution. I want us to go back to the constitutional issue that was brought up earlier. We have, of course, debated the Constitution many times here, even in this session. And yet here we are debating a bill that is designed to test, if not outright diminish, constitutional rights that have been recognized. We cannot pretend that the American right to privacy is fictional or is in some way a creation of the courts. It's not new to our country. It's not new as a historical development. In the 1850s, Elizabeth I respected the right to privacy in reference to religion, pronouncing she would not make windows into men's souls. It came, no doubt, to be plainly included as a human right reflected in much of the Bill of Rights. Judge Thomas M. Cooley offered his access assessment to the right to privacy in the 1800s, simply labeling it the right to be let alone, inspiring Warren and Brandeis to publish their famous Harvard Law Review article, The Right to Privacy, in 1890. 
In Griswold versus Connecticut, a 1965 U.S. Supreme Court decision, the court said, and I'm quoting here, we deal with a right of privacy older than the Bill of Rights, older than our political parties, older than our school system. Just look at the actual language from the Roe versus Wade decision, a 1973 Supreme Court decision that we've discussed here before. Some of you may remember Senator Sinclair and I had an exchange of views on this one. But it's worth returning to that core decision as we debate the underlying concept of whether or not the state has the ability to limit that constitutional right to privacy. Let's look at the language of the decision. The right to privacy, whether it be founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty and restrictions upon state action, as we feel it is, or the district court determined in the Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. We therefore conclude that the right of personal privacy includes the abortion decision, but that right is not unqualified. And the decision goes on to state, this holding we feel is consistent with the relative weights of the respective interests involved, with the lessons and examples of medical and legal history, with the lenity of common law, and with the demands of profound problems of the present day. This decision leaves the state free to place increasing restriction on abortion as the period of pregnancy lengthens. So long as those restrictions are tailored to the recognized state interests. The decision vindicates the right of the physician to administer medical treatment according to his professional judgment up to the points where the important state interests provide compelling justifications for the intervention. Up to those points, the abortion decision in all its aspects inherently and primarily a medical decision and basic responsibility for it must rest with the physician. This bill, as it is written, and, it, and this amendment, it's unconstitutional, and it, it intentionally goes too far for a reason. The goal is to get a court case in position to challenge Roe versus Wade altogether. It seeks truthfully to implement an effective ban on nearly all abortions in this state with exceedingly rare and strict exceptions. This type of legislation has succeeded in other states in getting the courts to make a constitutional review, but with a clear trend. These laws are routinely struck down. We can look to North Dakota or Arkansas as recent examples. We can also look to Senator Garrett's efforts earlier this session to change the Iowa Supreme Court's ability to interpret the Constitution as part of a plan here. But what I think is most ironic here, though, is that when this bill gets to the point where it is going to see a constitutional review, it will be these drafting shortfalls that I had an exchange with Senator Chapman about just moments ago where this whole mess is decided to be unenforceable. This legislation is something that should have never reached this point. It is an attack on the right to privacy is an attack on abortion rights that will threaten Iowa's women and their access to reproductive health care. This is a game of political brinksmanship that will fail in the courts, but until it does, it will harm women's health care in our state. 